We're going to continue with chapters 3 and 12, and we're going to move into talking about least squares regression lines, which is actually just your line of best fit. Um, and then we'll talk about a couple other things that are related to scatter plots as well. So we are on page uh, 7 in the notes. And let's talk about this least squared regression line or regression lines in general. So a regression line is a line that describes how a response variable changes, aka your y, as an explanatory variable, x, changes. We use a regression line to predict the value of y for a given value of x. So if we take a look at this scatter plot that's over here, this is showing the uh, price of a car based on the miles that are driven. So it's got this relationship that's shown here. This is our regression line right here, and it's used to predict the price for um, the number of miles that are driven. A regression line is a model for data, much like density curves um, model a distribution. So the equation of a regression line gives a compact mathematical description of what this model tells us about the relationship between the two variables. You all have seen regression lines. You've called them the line of best fit. We're gonna be referring to that line of best fit as the least squares regression line. So how do we write that least squares regression line or that line of best fit? We use this right in here, and this is y with that little carrot on top. Remember we had p hat that looked similar to that? Well, this is called y hat. And then for whatever reason in statistics, we don't, you know, normally a line is y equals mx plus b. In statistics, for whatever reason, we write the y-intercept first and we refer to that as a. So we go a plus bx. And you should just know that the number in front of x is your slope. So as I said, this is y hat. It is the predicted um, y value or the predicted value of the response variable. B is the slope, and it's important that you are able to interpret the slope, and we'll formally define that down below. But it's the amount by which y is predicted um, when x is increased by one unit. And A is the y-intercept, and that represents the predicted value of y when x is equal to zero. So the difference between y and y hat is y is your actual observed value, and y hat is the uh, predicted value for the y based on the regression model. So for example, if we look at the scatter plot and we look at this, my actual y value would be whatever that is, a little bit more than 35,000. The predicted y value is where it falls on the actual line for that given x value. This formula is on the formula sheet. Oops, sorry. A plus BX on the formula sheet on your um, for your exam, so it's not something you need to memorize, just know what each thing represents. They are big on interpreting the slope, so make sure that you are aware of the interpretation of the slope. For each increase in X by one, the Y is predicted, and keyword to include there, predicted to increase by however much it is. And then as I said, your Y-intercept y is an estimate of Y when x is equal to uh, zero. So we will go through this example together right now, and then the next example we will do in class. So don't you hate it when you open a can of soda and some of the contents spray out of the can? Two AP statistics students, Haley and Nick, wanted to investigate if tapping on a can would reduce the amount of soda expelled um, after the can had been shaken. For their experiment, they vigorously shook 40 cans of soda and randomly assigned each to be tapped for either zero, four, eight, or 12 seconds. Then after opening the can and cleaning up the mess, the students measured the amount of soda left in each can. So they shook the can up, they either didn't tap it at all, they tapped it for four seconds, eight or 12, and they measured how much um, soda was left in the can. So here is our scatter plot. Notice that they've written it with the actual words as opposed to y and x, which is a good idea for you to use. So if we look at this scatter plot, it would be y hat equals 248.6 plus 2.63 times x, but they've replaced the x with tapping time and the uh, y with soda. So how do we interpret the slope? So think about slope for each increase in one unit in my x, y is predicted to increase by 2.63. So now we need to Put that into some context. So for each one second increase in tapping time, the amount of soda, and I forgot the word, oh, there it is. The predicted amount of soda remaining increases by 2.63 milliliters. So for every one second increase here, the amount of soda remaining is predicted, keyword, to increase by 
2.63 my slope. The y-intercept says, okay, if the amount of tapping time is equal to zero seconds, it is, and again, we use that word predicted, there will be 248.6 milliliters of soda left in the can. Okay, so make sure you are comfortable with these definitions and interpretations of the slope and the y-intercept. In part B, it says predict the amount of uh, the amount for a can that has been tapped for 10 seconds. So we didn't tap any cans for 10 seconds, but we can use the graph and more importantly use the equation to predict that. So all we're going to do is take 10 and plug it in for the tapping time. So 10 seconds being plugged in for the tapping time, you will get your predicted uh, amount of soda remaining to be 274.9 milliliters. So all we did there was plug 10 in for the tapping time. We do the same thing in part C, where it says predict the amount of remaining uh, for a can that's been tapped for 60 seconds. How confident are you in this prediction? So if we go ahead and we, we uh, plug in 60, we're going to get 406.4 milliliters. Now I want you to take a look at this graph. Notice my regression line and all of my data, I only went from tapping times from zero to 12 seconds. So that 60 seconds is way outside of that range where my regression line is, is based off of. We end up getting that answer of 406.4. That's not reasonable. I didn't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you that the can can only hold 355 milliliters. So now it's saying there's going to be more soda left than the can can even hold. Okay. So this is not a reasonable prediction and you should not be very confident. Okay, all of the tapping times, like I said, were between zero and 12 seconds. So our regression model is based off of uh, values that are from zero to 12 seconds. We can't use this model to predict for something like 60 seconds. That's far outside of the range that my model is based off of. This leads to inaccurate predictions. This is what we call extrapolation. Okay, extrapolation means that you're using your model to predict for values that are far outside of the range that your model is based off of. And as I said, it often leads to an inaccurate prediction. You want to interpolate. We, we used our model to predict for 10 seconds, which made sense because 10 was within that value or that range of zero to 12 seconds. 60 is far outside of it, so it's not reasonable to predict for that. got another example which we'll go through in class so let's head to the top of page nine at the top of page nine we formally define extrapolation so extrapolation is the re is the use of the regression line for prediction far outside the interval of values of the explanatory variable which is x used to obtain the line such predictions are often not accurate it is bad you do not want to extrapolate so you don't want to make predictions using values of x that are much larger or much smaller than those that actually appear in your data. So for example, if I was dealing with people's heights, I was comparing their heights and their weights, and everybody's heights were between, uh, say, 60 and 65 inches, I shouldn't use the model that I create to predict for somebody who's 45 inches tall or somebody who's 85 inches tall, um, because it's not going to lead to an accurate prediction. Why is it dangerous? Because there's no guarantee that the linear pattern will continue, okay? If you think back to the truck example, which you're gonna see in class, it's really not gonna be a linear pattern that's going to continue forever. Um, the price of a car as the miles increase is actually gonna become exponential at some point. So some common errors here. Many students lose credit on the AP exam for not sitting at the slope is the predicted, as I've stressed, um, change in the y variable, variable rather for each one unit increase in the x. Okay, um, so make sure that you're saying that it is on average and the predicted amount. Make sure that you include the hat over the y value when you're asked to write the equation of a regression line, and understand the difference between the actual value and the predicted value. This is an old formula; they've since changed this in the last year. So on the formula sheet, it is now listed as y hat. Um, equals a plus bx, so you don't have to worry about this um, formula sheet kind of tidbit here. Next thing that we're going to talk about is residuals. So in most cases, no line will pass exactly through all the points on the scatter plot. A good regression line makes the vertical distances of the points from the line as small as possible. So when we're looking at a regression line, we want to minimize this distance, the distance from my points and my actual, or sorry, my points and my regression line. 
The smaller these distances are, the uh, more accurate and the better the prediction of your model is. So those differences are called a residual. A residual is the difference between an observed value of the response and the value predicted by the regression line. It's your actual Y minus your predicted Y. To remember the order, think AP. Actual minus predicted. Actual minus predicted. Um, in the symbolic notation, it is Y minus Y hat. Okay, so your residual measures the distance um, between your actual value that you observed and the predicted value from the regression line. You can think of the residual as the leftover, okay? How far the actual Y value is from the predicted. So we're looking at this data point and we're looking at the vertical deviation, the vertical distance from the regression line that is shown. When you're asked to interpret the residual, make sure you give the size and the direction of the residual. So we want to give both the size and the direction when we're talking about the residual. And we'll go through this example in class. So when we're talking about the direction here, we're saying, okay, um, the actual uh, price for a car driven 40,000 miles is whatever it is, I don't know, $7,000 below the predicted price from our um, regression model. Something like that would be your interpretation of the residual. Different regression lines produce different residuals. The regression line that we care most about, which we formally referred to in earlier classes in your math career as a line of best fit, is called the least squares regression line because it minimizes the sum of the squared residuals. If you add up the residuals, okay, you're going to get a number that's close to zero. But if we square the residuals, we're going to get that value. And the, the least squares regression under the line of best fit, in essence, what it's doing is it's minimizing these distances. Okay, it's minimizing the distances of the squared residuals. How can we determine the best regression line? As I said, it's the line that minimizes the sum of the squared residuals. This isn't something you'd have to do by hand. Technology is going to do it for you. Um, the mean X value, mean Y value point will always be on the least squares regression line. So the line will always go through that point of whatever the mean of your X values are and the mean of your Y values. And to find the least squares regression line, it's really easy. We have a set of data. So in stat edit, if I have a set of data, which I do here, and I want to find the line of best fit or the least squares regression line on my calculator, stat over to calc. And then you either can use number four or number eight uses it in the, the order that we write it in stat. Don't have to change anything with L1, L2 or your frequency list. <clears throat> Just hit calculate. And you'll get your least squares regression line. Here's your y-intercept and here is your slope. Okay. So you, you can certainly use technology. You're expected to use technology to find the least squares regression line. The least squares regression line is not resistant to outliers, okay? Outliers strongly influence the slope. Just like we saw that um, R, our correlation coefficient, is not resistant to outliers, the least squares regression line is also not resistant to outliers. We'll go through the next example in class. Where we're asked to create the least squares regression line and interpret the slope and the y-intercept and find some residuals. We have this thing that's called a residual plot. So a residual plot is a scatter plot of the residuals against the explanatory variable x. What residual plots help us do is they help us to assess how well a regression line fits the data. So here is your scatter plot, and here is the residual plot. And it's all it's doing is it's <clears throat> plotting each individual residual versus the x value. So for example, you can see this one here is going to have a really tiny residual just above zero. That's why it corresponds to this point right in here. Okay, so that's all that this is doing is it's plotting your residuals against your x values. The calculator can do this for you, and I will show you how to do it on the calculator in a second. We just want to talk about what a residual plot does. So a residual plot, as I said, magnifies the deviations of the points on the line making it easier to see unusual observations and patterns. 
we do not want to see a pattern in the residual plot. Okay, so the residual plot should show no obvious pattern and the residual um, should be relatively small. If there is no pattern in the residuals, then a linear model is appropriate. If there's a pattern in the residuals, like we see in these two, where we have a clear pattern in our residuals, then our linear model is not an appropriate model to be using for that particular scatter plot. So say you wanted to take a look at the residual plot. Well, on your calculator, your calculator can make a scatter plot for you. If you go to second and y equals, and go to your plots and hit enter, if I just leave it like this, that first value in here is a scatter plot, and if I just have L1 and L2 in here, and I always go to zoom and nine for zoom stat, I will see the scatter plot of my data. I can hit the trace key and I can see each individual value that's related to my scatter plot, and I can arrow through them. So these are all my data that I had put in L1 and L2. But say I wanted to see the residual plot. I'm gonna go to second and y equals again. I'm gonna go to my plot. And I'm going to keep my X list as at, at L1, but I'm going to change where it says the Y list. So I'm going to arrow down to Y list because in a residual plot, your X stays the same, but your Y list is a, a plot of the residuals. So I can change that Y list from L2 to the residuals by going to second and stat, which will get me to my list. So second and stat, and notice number seven is resid. So I'm going to go down to number seven and hit enter. And now it's going to plot my X values to my residuals. Zoom number nine again, and this is a plot of the residuals. So if I hit the trace key, I can see these Ys right in here are each of my individual residuals for each of these corresponding X values. And again, I can arrow through them and I can see each of the individual residuals here, okay? So the value of X equal to 18 had a positive residual of 10.15. What does that mean? It means that my actual value was 10.15 above what the regression line predicted. Okay, so you can use your calculator to create a residual plot by going to second and y equals and changing your L2 value, or sorry, your y list value from L2 to resid. As I said, the purpose of a residual plot is used to determine if a linear model is appropriate. If there's a random scatter slash no pattern in your residual plot, then a linear model is appropriate. If there's some type of pattern involved, like we saw in the, the two previous examples, then a linear model is not appropriate. We will go through the remaining part, example three, related to the McDonald's beef sandwiches in class. See everybody then.